Hello, everyone. Things might look a little bit different. Today is December 22nd. It's one week after our live webinar that we recorded, um, but we were uh, not 100% successful in recording our live webinar. We only got about half of it. So um, everybody all got together, except uh, Rory couldn't make it back on this uh, on the second one. But uh, we're going to do our best to recreate what uh, the magic that we had going in that first one um, and talk about the rest of the process that, uh, that we were talking about before. And um, so we kind of left off with Ozen talking about, uh, about his production and, and his pre-production and that sort of thing. And um, so we'll go ahead and, uh, and continue on. Uh, great, welcome back everyone. Um... So I guess my film, Inspiration, um, my film kind of got uh, inspired from Japanese uh, vending machines. Um, actually, when me and Mac were out there in Japan, we did a little job there about a couple of years ago. Um, I saw a lot of these vending machines that are kind of randomly placed throughout the whole city. And when I did some research onto them, um, they're actually out in the middle of Nora, which is crazy. Um, and Mac, I don't know if you can bring up some of those images of these uh, random vending, vending machines. Um, the cool thing about these machines is that they sell the most randomest things, everything from like pennies to DVDs to food to ramen, which is super cool. But I just love the isolation factor that it's just in the middle of nowhere and there's power running into this machine. Um, and you can grab like a fresh beverage or something like that. Um, so I was actually really inspired by that. And my film actually is basically one of the main characters is a machine that pretty much um, that pretty much decides the fate of a couple that's stranded out in the middle of the forest. Um, and the, the, to run it down to the basic idea, it's basically about technology ver versus nature. Um, there's this wonderful contrast of this high tech visual machine that's like pumping out visuals of projections and um, graphics and it's almost like dance revolution on like, uh, on, on acid basically, just a, a crazy, visual production in the middle of the forest um and there's this nice contrast between it and then we have this stranded couple that's pretty much stuck in the middle of anywhere uh, and it's stuck in the middle of in no. the forest mm -hmm. um and th they approach the machine the machine pretty much is justice it's smarter than them uh, i won't give too much away, away of what happens but um the machine essentially decides their fate um within in the middle of this area um, another cool thing, um, me and Mac, we both own uh, NXSs, Acura NXSs. Um, and it's something that is, it's hard to explain, but this car is a design that is timeless. You can almost transport it to any type of future or whatever, and it will just feel natural in its place. Um, so I'm actually going to be incorporating uh, this car into the film as well. And it's probably one of the first films, I don't know if you guys seen a lot of my work, it's very high driven, high octane, like knee to the groin, aggressive, pure adrenaline rush. Um, and this is probably the first time where there will be a car in it, but more as a secondary prop in the background. So I'm actually really excited just to kind of change in pace for my work that I've done. Um, but I just love what this car has represented for me for like growing up in, in the world. Um, the design is super cool, it's timeless. Me and Mac both own one, they're super rad. So I just wanted to feature it and showcase it in this film. Um, and you're almost put a twist onto it. You're What's gonna that? modify the car, right? Um, That's it's gonna be correct, a yeah, yeah. Car. <laughs> because my, my film doesn't take place on earth. It's a, I'm gonna put, put my, own, my own style into the car to help kind of integrate it into the world, this like cyberpunk NSX version. So hopefully I'm gonna pay tribute to that and hopefully all the, NSX fans won't hate me for it, but I want to do something that's kind of unique with it, um, with the same design of the Japanese um, vending machine and have the two blend together. Um, so that's pretty much my inspiration on the film. Um, again, I'm in pre-production as we were talking about earlier from before. Um, and like I said, that these guys are kind of like going through the earlier stages. So I'm kind of just watching from the sidelines and watching what to avoid before I start we jumping in before we start jumping into mine, which we actually are doing it right now during the Christmas break. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of at a different stage, which is great uh, yeah. for, for Elk. Um, but uh, yeah, it's gonna be pretty exciting once we get the ball rolling on it, so. 
Very cool. Thanks, I think uh, next we were going to talk about um, your process. Well, I guess uh, Mac and Adriana's process uh, on shooting um, yeah. your films. Yeah, so shooting, let me get some images here. Um, so we ended up shooting, um, did we talk about Iceland? I forgot. Um, ended up combining the shoots of ice and and deal um, in Iceland. We, we ended up doing both of them because Iceland has this amazing light over there, beautiful landscapes, uh, just, just the right look for the project. Um, and we went there like middle of November when the days start to be become very, very short. Like, I don't know, I think the daylight is five hours. Um, and there's areas of the of the of the island that are covering the snow. Others are covering in um, no no it's not yet. There's still grass and trees. So I'm showing you some footage here of of when we saw the deal. We ended up shooting on Alexa Mini and Panavision E series, which are the best anamorphic lenses ever made. Really like the look of them. They were developed in the 1980s, obviously by Panavision, and and just you can any movie, sci-fi, action, anything you like uh, from that era, 80s and 90s um, was shot with these lenses. Think about Ridley Scott, Tony Scott, anything like that. Um, even Ocean's favorite director, Michael Mann. Sorry, Michael Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Mann, uh, so, Okay, sorry, it still uses those. Um, yeah. uh, so it was, it was a, Oh, here we, you can see all the gear uh, stacked together. We ended up bringing all the camera equipment from from LA just, just to get uh, exactly what we needed. But our crew was small, like only one camera system, one R person, one wardrobe person, um, uh, just because obviously we need to travel there. But they did an amazing job. Um, we, we, we had a very reduced team um, for, for both Deal and Ice, but um, but they really, really, everybody did, everyone wore multiple hats and they did it very well. Um, so for example, in this forest here, which surprisingly in Iceland, there's not that many forests because I, I believe, um, I don't know, are they Vikings? Back in the day, they, they cut down, cut down all, all, all the, the trees. trees yeah. uh, so the trees, the forests there are very young, but anyway, here, um, we ended up putting all these flags that we had actually 3D printed the stencil, is that how you call it? Um, to, to make those stamps, we had fog machine. We've got that sunlight on sunlight on the top left. It's actually our light because the days over there are very dark and moody. But uh, we put that, that um, I think it was an HMI 4K for the people interested in cinematography here with, uh, with a G CTO gel so that it would look like the sand and we would have consistency all day long on, on how, how the light looks. Uh, we were using a run-in just to move around, very difficult terrain actually to move on. And the weather was horrible, like obviously super cold and started raining and windy, just, just very miserable. Which works the for the film though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Is the fog because real? Is the fog rain or is it actually? No, the fog, fog was fog machines and the yeah. rain is real. It's, it's, it was just that look. And because originally <laughs> us, we were trying to shoot this in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, and we were like, just because the mood and the look that on these photos right now, which is the same looks in the footage is exactly what we were after. Yeah. And Los Angeles has perfect weather pretty much every yeah. year. Yeah. Um, so we were like, okay, so what if we shoot just at sunset? It was like, oh, okay, but we're only going to have an hour a day to shoot. That is not doable. And just just the mood, um, the texture, you're not going to get it um, in LA. So that was one of the reasons to to mm. go. Um, I don't know if the video plays real time. To go to Iceland. So this was one of the days that the Alex had rehearsed the the main. Alex is our actress. Yeah, yeah. The, all the choreography everybody knew what to do so that had been pre-planned for months in LA um so that helped a lot when we got there is that okay we know exactly what we need to do um this is our our stunt people that also flew from LA <laughs> with their super awesome fake swords 
say, yeah, we did the choreography with Ryan. Did we did end up building, so the wardrobe, we can talk for a second, that was great. You can throw some of the names there um, and makeup as well. You can see some of the tattoos. Um, it has a lot of Japanese inspiration, but a little bit of, of um, North European look. And we ended up finishing the, the wardrobe once we were in Iceland, trying to source those leather straps and stuff like that um, on site over there, which is this mix. And I think it creates, it helps create a, a more rich world when it's, it, this is not a Japanese world in the Middle Ages. It, it has a lot of the Viking influence in it. How long were you there? I think we spent in Iceland about two weeks, maybe one entire week shooting and one week of pre-production. Mm. Mark and I were there for two weeks and the main team for a week. Yeah. I think a bit more than a week. Maybe a bit more than a week. But you know, scouting maybe. locations and all of this. Um, so here's some, some behind the scenes footage. Obviously the landscapes over there are amazing. In terms of the effects, you don't need a lot because the, the I mean, landscapes in Iceland are just incredible. This is some footage from the film. I don't want to show too much because still is work in progress. But you did show your scene with, uh, when you were doing uh, rehearsals in the park uh, with the scene. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to finish that one off for sure. <laughs> It's interesting about locations like Iceland offers so much valuable in terms of production value. Um, for elk, uh, we've been discussing about maybe, I would love to shoot it as is as well within the forest, uh, but also we've been thinking about using Mandalorian technology and using LED panels um, mm -hmm. as another possibility, but we're still kind of wrapping our heads around it to see what's the best effective tool to it, towards it to get the constant perfect lighting. Um, right, it's fighting the elements also because yeah. I remember the, the the fake blood, right? The makeup blood in Iceland, it would freeze on our actors <laughs> because it is that cold. Um, and of course, if you're in the States, uh, in Vancouver or Los Angeles, you're not going to have that problem. You can make it look cold without yeah. actually being that cold. And you have the perfect lighting all day, so there you go. Yeah. Um, uh, these are this is these are some stills from. Uh, from Rory's uh, ice film mm -hmm. and I think it was uh, at the top of a glacier where we we drove there in the morning on that big vehicle that actually also how do you say it also worked at the spaceship uh, reference which it, will be that vehicle will re be replaced with a spaceship in post yeah it ended up being a picture car um yeah. I I found it's great I because because um, this, glacier, this glacier is actually driving distance from Reykjavik, the uh, capital of Iceland. So we were able to stay in Reykjavik um, and then drive here really early in the morning, shoot all day and then go back home mm. um, at the end of the day, which was really practical, really wonderful for us. So all this area is covered in snow, but this is literally three days after we were shooting in that forest with no snow. So we were right on the verge of the weather changing really rapidly. Yeah. This was um, in, in November, I think you said? In yeah. November. The the challenge of, um, of or the, the great thing about Iceland for us, we're like, okay, we can go in the middle of November, we can find places with a lot of snow, and we can also find a forest with no snow that, you know, looks, looks not like, has the perfect elements to be a magical magical temperate forest. Um, and we found both in the same place. It was a little bit challenging, like Max said, because weather is very variable there and nobody can guarantee how it's gonna change um, from, from we were within having, one day even. Yeah. Getting the snow started to be, become a, a problem. A problem um, because, oh yeah, yeah, there's the snow in this part of the island and then you would go there and the day after the snow has melted. And when you say this part of the island, it's a five, six hour drive. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but we were lucky yeah. here. Those are Panavision lenses uh, being frozen, but still they work really well, I'm surprised. Did the um, focus grease get tight on them or no, during the cold weather? Uh, no, Technic they told us that the back focus uh, would be affected by the cold yeah. because the lenses and the metal changes. Uh, if it was, it was now ne ne how do you say negligible. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, but I, actually, this image is great because that shows the type of lighting that you get over there in Iceland at that time of the day. And you would be like, oh, that looks like sunset. Yeah, but imagine that lasts for three or four hours. Um, just stays low like that, which is pretty beautiful. Well, then when you shoot, are you going to shoot in uh, in BC? Yeah, I mean, like, because we're in a kind of a weird COVID situation. Um, there's thought I would love to do it in BC because I have a lot of resources here. Uh, Vancouver is quite diverse in terms of locations, and it's also Hollywood North up here. Um, so the idea would be to shoot it up here. Also, my car is up here as well. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I would love to do it here. Uh, it's just easier for getting gear. And these guys, like Mac and Andre, can, can come up from LA mm -hmm. via flight. Um, but unfortunately, COVID, it's kind of put a little bit of a ripple through um you know how it's going to work out so hopefully early in the early 2020 or in january we're going to start getting get the ball rolling on it but um yeah vancouver bc is going to hopefully be the uh battleground for uh for yeah, the good thing for you is that vancouver has the right exact look um yeah mood, right for what you want west coast yeah it rains constantly i'm always jealous of california hot weather but for this case, I actually need the rain. I actually need the dampness. I need the fog. Um, so it's almost perfect timing right now. Um, but um, yeah, I just, I, I would prefer to do everything in camera than it's real, as opposed to going towards this LED projection stuff, which is another thought. Um, but um, yeah, we'll see how it works out, but definitely 100% in Vancouver, so. Mm -hmm. Something that works when you're on location is like on this image, for example, you see all the eyes um, accumulated on the suit and it looks real because it, it is real. It's like uh, minus 10 degrees on a blizzard. Um, so, you know, for that, it's it's convenient to be on the real location, but also it was really difficult. You, we could not even hear us ourselves like 10 feet away from each other because the wind is just so mm -hmm. strong. So there are advantages of shooting on, on a stage for sure. Man. They made us wear these orange vests because you see how the background looks, right? You walk a yeah. uh, hundred feet that way, nobody, nobody will ever see you again. Like it's just, uh, it looks like a cyclorama almost. Like there's no end. <laughs> I was, I saw one of those earlier images where you had the shot of the of a couple of your cars you, that you probably took to get to the location, and one of them was white. And I was like, wait, that car would probably get lost in this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How many days was Rory shoot? Was this over one day or two days? Uh, I think it ended up being three days. Oh, three days. Um, yeah. yeah, because we did one day here in this type of location where it's, yeah. there's no snow. That we were waiting for the snow, and then the other two days are um, one day on the top of the glacier and one day at the base of the glacier. Uh, okay. Um, like this. This is yeah. But I mean, it's amazing light wise to be able to shoot all day long, and. Um, and have perfect lighting, basically. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Great. Um, let's let's go a little bit into the red um, production mm -hmm. for red. No, 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 Kevin. Uh, you want to guide us? What is, what's what's next? Yeah. Um, post production. Um, you know what kind of the process that you went through or are going through right now um, with your post production work. Let's see. So. Originally, we started this as, hey, let's make One Minute Worlds. One of the reasons is that the they're short. So post-production is should be pretty short, right? Um, but of course, we ended up doing a lot of VFX, or we are still doing that. And with COVID, that, that is not helping because actually a lot, a lot of our artists are getting sick and, and you know, lockdowns and stuff like that. So on ICE, I'll, I'll speak for Rory here. We've got uh, the spaceship model, which looks amazing. What's the name of the designer? Andreas. Andreas? Mm -hmm. um, and beautiful, beautiful design. And this will replace that uh, truck the or, or, or tank, basically. The vehicle, the vehicle that you mm -hmm. saw on, on the glacier. And that's how our hero arrives. And here's a couple. This is what we're working on. These are early renders on, on the spaceship taking um, landing, basically. Um, so just the modeling by itself, it's it's a lot of work just to get it, you know, Star Wars quality, at least. That's where we're aiming at. Yeah, there, and there's a lot of VFX, other, this is 
I would say the main VFX asset for ICE that we're working on, but the um, the hand analyzer that the that the rigger is holding that shows him that analyzes the the conditions of the area is also another another VFX element we're working on and. Um, some secret monsters, which I should not mention, um, and we don't want to show because it's kind of the reveal, <laughs> the big reveal. Um, but there's there's a lot of VFX going into it. Yeah, we'll there's a there's on. a heavy post production component to this, and yeah. but the good thing is that you know computers are very fast these days. We've got amazing ASA monitors that we're all working with, and um, we can do a lot of it at home, especially now that there's lockdowns or or during Christmas and that has been an advantage of the pandemic. It's like, okay, well, we're at home now. <laughs> um, no more commercials. Let's work right. on this. <laughs> so are you sharing um, with each person in the in the process? Are you sharing your calibration setup uh, on your monitor with um, with the people that you're working with? Or are right. you so, using the so Lawson has his ASA monitor? I have my ASA monitors here, Rory has them. So we're all in the same color space, same exact settings. So because I was the cinematographer for Rory, then, and he's doing, I don't know, some exports or some, some whatever he's doing, I know exactly that we're looking at the same thing. And that it, that's very helpful, actually. It's, there's no guessing there. And some of the artists also are using the same screen. Uh, so when we say, because some of the light levels are, how can I say this? Um, it, the stories happen on very low light levels, so it's very. We need to be picky on what we're yeah. the levels we're showing. It's not like yeah, it looks okay. No, it's like okay, just bring the blacks two two points out of the two fifty six up, um, and that that helps a lot basically because we're we're all in the same page. We don't need to be guessing. Is that oh, but is your Brian is too high, whatever. It's just, right. it's just right. very straightforward. So it's one yeah. less thing to worry about. Yeah, and, and the monitors that you have are 1500 to one contrast ratio monitors. So you can see in the in the dark area um, in, in order to be able to make those decisions. So and, and something to me is very, not very important, but when it's it, the viewing angle, basically, that you know, you're a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and that affects a lot. And I think that's gone. And we don't have that issue anymore, which is which is great because. Uh, so so what we're seeing with the two of you right now, this happens quite often with the two of you sitting next to each other making decisions yeah, on uh, yeah. your screen. <laughs> knowing the knowing to have the accuracy on both sides is super important, especially for me. Like my previous monitors were all over the place, um, and to finally have something that's true or know what I'm looking at is true um, is actually super important. And I wish I've actually done it earlier. Um, so it's a it's a tool that's essential that I um, that I, I embrace and I am I'm happy about it. So I just know that what I'm looking at is correct, what Max looking at is correct, and everyone else um, it just keeps things consistency and it's true, which is the most important thing. Great. Yeah, because yeah, you know, you you always ask me, yeah, but nobody has not necessarily everybody has this monitor. Yeah, but they're gonna watch it on their iPad or whatever on the TV. But if I know this is correct, at least that is consistent. Like yeah, it's, for I some reason, someone has the TV completely messed up that their fault, but um, you, you need a guidance. Right. So, so when, you're, um, when you ultimately deliver uh, the deliverable, is it, is it mostly intended to be viewed in Rec 709 or is it P3 or what is it? So great question. It's be, to, for me, it's between sRGB and 709. And mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but the color space is the same. The levels are slightly different. And, you know, right? The, the blacks, the shadows on, on 709, they're a little bit more compressed. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, if you grade correctly for, it's hard. I, my feeling is that most of the people are going to watch this on an sRGB uh, device. Uh, less on TV, more more on computers. Mm -hmm. Then I'm gonna, in my opinion, we should grade it for seven or not. Sorry, for sRGB. But I know what I'm gonna get when I go to seven or not. If we were going to cinemas, uh, sure, P3, and then do the digital conversion. But I, we will end up being there. But um, 
I've been very successful grading on sRGB slash 709. And when we do the, the, the cinema conversion, uh, that's fine. It, it translates really well by, by, the, by whoever is doing that master. Um, but I feel most people just at the end of the day, it's sad, but they're watching on their phone, they're watching on an iPad, they're watching on a computer. Um, and that's what matters. And if it goes to TV, I just I leave a little bit of room on those on those shadows just just to to be sure to, to be sure that it works. If you if you're able to uh, to distribute it on a platform that has uh, HDR, would you um, also do an HDR grade? Um, yes, for sure. Um, and I th I mean Netflix pushes a lot towards that, right? And and all the digital platforms because obviously it's it's the best. Uh, platform to go that way better than TV. Um, and the good thing, we've got, we've got a, a very nice panel here and I, I, it's, it's easy to switch. And it's like, all right, how would this look if it was on HDR? It's simple to do. Excellent. Um, how about, let's talk about uh, those Fewer questions that we had. Oh, great. I was just going to say, before you go on the questions, these are, this is some of the post-production for, for Deal, the, the one with the with the, uh, the sword fight in the beginning. Uh -huh. And we've got a CGI creature, of course. We're making it difficult for us to show in some, some references here. Um, that's, that's a concept. That I think it's so impressive. It's awesome. Um, so it's coming up um, to life. Uh, slowly, but uh, we, sure. we're almost there. Slowly, sure. Surely. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting baked over Christmas. <laughs> and and oh, so your your thing is also it also has a lot of posts, correct? Not a lot, but definitely not not too much. I mean, there's a vending machine that I'm hoping that we could maybe do a hybrid, like build it like 80 percent of the way, and then maybe um, there's a lot of like 3D projection hologram stuff in mine. So obviously there is going to be a design aspect to that, which is going to be important. Um, the car itself is going to be a total revamp of what the NSX is as well. So there is actually, there is quite a bit of visual effects in it, but I think the more in camera, the better. And, and hopefully we can achieve that to a certain point. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. These guys are going through, through a heavy post-production phase. So I'm kind of learning from it and just kind of trying to, keep as much in camera as possible, but also there's a reality of how much you can do. And we'll be banking on, you know, the CG element to help bridge the world together and tell my story. Yeah. Very nicely said. Okay. So Kevin, you were asking something, sorry about it. Oh yeah, no problem. I didn't realize, I, did, I, I should not have keep, kept going. <laughs> I was just pushing it along, but um, we can, uh, if you'd like, we can uh, go through the, the audience questions that we had when we were live. Great. Um, and uh, you might remember that uh, uh, Mac, when you, um, when you first started talking about your inspiration, you uh, mentioned uh, a book, a Japanese book that, uh, that inspired you. Right, and, right, right. Uh, Ryan asked what the name of that book was. So let's see if you can read, hold on. It says on weird font, it says, we Japanese, um, and this is volume two, there's one, two, and three. I feel volume two is the best. Um, it's made out of, um, I, I sound like a, like a QVC person, um, but every, there's a story or a topic per page. This is printed on some sort of rice paper. And of course, this book is really old. Actually, this edition is from 94. 1937, uh, but you can find them on eBay between 10 and $100. It varies a lot, um, but it's almost like a piece of history. We Japanese. Great. Um, this might have been from Ryan as well. I don't think I have the name on this question, but uh, what program did you use to create the 3D prints? Um, so, That's a I, no, because I've, we've done a lot of, um, basically the end of the story is any 3D software will work. Your 
you export it as FBX or OBDA, and you just import that file. It needs to be an enclosed um, object. It cannot because 3D literally. It's, I mean, there, there's no there's no depth to it. This 3D software, sorry, the 3D printing software will actually add the thickness of it. But almost pretty much any 3D software will work, and then you import that on the 3D printing software, and you just need to fix, need need to build a lot. It's not something very straightforward. You need to work a little bit and learn what things work or not. Um, but Andrew did 3D Max, I believe. I did 3D Max, but there were things that were done on Cinema for the. There, there was a little bit of everything. Okay. Um, Roy asked, where can these films be seen? All right. And uh, <laughs> once they're finished, um, you know, Vimeo, YouTube, Facebook, we'll put them, we'll make as much noise as possible. We'll, do to, we'll go to film festivals, uh, which obviously it's the best platform just to watch it on a really big mm -hmm. screen and with online, good sound. And online film publications as well. But um, we're going to put them for free. This is a yeah. passion project of us, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Instagram as well, of course. Like Rory said last time, we won't be subtle. You won't miss that, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess um, I'll add on to that. How about when? Yeah, when? Oh, when? when? I, I think Red and Deal will be finished on ice early 2021. Um, it all depends how close, honestly, us, the border with Canada, <laughs> Yeah. Um, how much longer is closed. Uh, I'm going to say the first... First quarter of 2021, we should have the first three films finished. And um, and by then, oh, your film should be filmed as well. So I yes, have yeah. a little bit extra to that. Um, Frank asks, are you going to take these stories forward with bigger concepts or are they only for one minute worlds? A um, couple more add-ons to that. How many more do you want to do? And could you have submission contests for ideas Ooh. how interesting yeah. so are you planning to do more with these other than just the one minute worlds and what would you do and how would you do it i guess is really what it comes down to mm -hmm. um yes there are uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear ideas of course um but the idea is to make yeah, just be busy making them in between projects. So I don't want this to just be like a one-off and that's it. It's like, let's keep on going. And if if some of the stories evolve into longer pieces, that's great. That's maybe Genesis for a feature or for a TV show. But um, I think everybody involved here has so many ideas that it's, it doesn't stop here. There's There needs to be more. Okay. Um, we started with five. Um, we're starting with five. We we filmed three. Uh, Osis is the fourth, um, which we hope to film next year, and then we're working on on the fifth one as well. So we we still have um, we have, still have stuff to do, but absolutely, I think continuing these would be a dream for us. All right. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Omar. He asks. Did you color grade the film and how long did color grading take? Right, so the workflow we're doing, they're not color graded yet. The workflow we're doing is, we're, the camera, everything was shot in log. Um, we've got a, a preview LUT just to do the editing and the VFX. And that LUT is applied just for preview purposes, of course, because it's a preview LUT. Um, and once everything is, is, all the VFX or most of them are done, we'll do the color grading, uh, I think. I've asked my friend Matt Osborne, who is an amazing colorist. He's at Company 3 right now to help us out with the color. And Rory and I have worked with him before. Um, but we'd rather do the VFX because it would make no sense. I mean, it does help, but it doesn't make sense to, to spend a lot of time color grading scenes that 50% of them are going to be replaced with CGI or, or VFX of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, but the preview LUTs that we have, which is just, it's, it's just a variation of the Alexa 709 LUT, is good enough to give us everything you've seen on the previous, et cetera, to give us a good um, idea of how the footage is gonna look. Okay. Um, last one, and this one's from Corey. 
Corey wants to uh, wants you to talk a little bit more about red. Didn't it, it's only been mentioned, but it hasn't really been like talked about in depth. So, yeah. um, Corey wants no, to. No, we're running out of time. Um, <laughs> where where can I start? Very. I'll, I'll do a super quick overview. Right. Red, which is the film that looks like this. Mm -hmm. We shoot it in New Mexico, not Iceland, in the White Sands, which is this lo amazing location that um, I've been dying to go for many years. Uh, there's these white sand dunes, uh, which is basically the only place in the world where, where you can find them. And there's this blue light or blue hour right after sunset where everything becomes pink and it's an amazing visual location. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided to go there. And the story takes place in, in the very far future, the civilization where there's, it's a trial basically where this girl is being accused of, of something. I don't wanna spoil the story yet. Uh, but it was a story that had to be shot at the right time of the day. So we only had 20 minutes a day to shoot. So it took quite a bit, uh, quite a few days. And I, we wanted it to be very wardrobe and art department centric. centric. McGregor wanted to shoot this short only in blue hour. So that gave us 20 minutes per day. And we did not have an unlimited budget. So we shot for two days. Three days. Three, three days. days. Just for like a three two days. minute piece. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, Raluca made a lot of very nice concepts. Um, this girl in Germany helped a lot bringing those ex super crazy accessories mm -hmm. uh, to life. She has yes. a company of that. Yeah, she did a really great job. Uh, so these are some of the concepts. I'll just go quickly. But you see, a lot of work went into pre-production of this one. Um, and then we saw it. Where is it? Go back, go back, go back. All right. Ended up sitting there for three days. We we built the wardrobe uh, from scratch. We're lucky. Got amazing actors from LA. Rams has helped a lot. Uh, taking care of all the wardrobe. But again, very small team. We didn't have, uh, you know, the, 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 the buyer or the, or the big crew that the production, like this is a, the headpiece we ended up building. Um, these are some of the locations um, in New Mexico. And we did this about a month and a half before we went to Iceland. Okay. Yeah, some yeah. of the accessories that we made. Mac had the genius idea of using a wedding kimono in reverse for for the main characters, what a, you know, dress. Um, yeah, backwards. It's fantastic, yeah. It's yeah, backwards. so what the main actress is wearing is a, it's a hundred year old kimono from Japan, but it's, it's put the wrong way, but it has this alien looking. That's kind of cool. Look yeah. to it. Yeah. And Ramses is a very, very um, a talented wardrobe stylist and was able to pin it in all the right places. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up, as we said, shooting in, in the white sands only after the sun would set. We didn't do a, like, we didn't use Alexa Mini. We used E-Series, but uh, we use um, a, a regular Alexa for this. Um, it was also, I, I guess we made it difficult to ourselves. Weather or, or location, the, very hard on us because we're not in Iceland. It's not that cold, but it's it's pretty hot during the day. And once the sun disappears, it's freezing cold. And if you've ever been on sand or sand dunes, it's so tiring, and you get dust particles on all the gear. Uh, it's just painful. And on top of that, um, we wanted pristine sand dunes. So you're like, no, 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 no. Don't go to the left. You're gonna make uh, more footsteps. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> were you able to um block this area off or did you just go somewhere far enough away from everywhere else that you didn't expect anybody to come by so we great question we we did get our permits we had to be uh, oh, sorry i was gonna so on an area where we would have access with our vehicle so we couldn't be as far away from from you know from civilization yeah. uh where we, there would not be people around but even if there was like, you see on my mouse here, a couple of people in the background, they're just little dots and it's, it's fine. Um, it's easy to clean up. Yeah, and even it, it, it didn't, it's still a drive, but you know, we, we needed, we have so much gear that we need to bring on set that, um, that we need to be 
on an accessible area. Okay. Like for example, here we had strict rules. Everybody stays behind camera. No one is allowed to walk around it except for actors who had to do like a quarter mile drive or walk <laughs> behind the sand dunes <laughs> and just camp there. Um, which also this same thing happened with ice in Iceland in the snow because of the same reason if this, this astronaut or space cowboys in an ice planet, you cannot see a single footstep besides his. Otherwise the whole point of being alone is gone. Yeah. <laughs> How long did it take you to decide uh, basically your, like when you picked the site that you were gonna shoot like this, how long did it take you to find that? Um, it, it took about a week per sort. It, it's not, to me, locations are the most important almost element on, on getting good photography. So just getting to the right place. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a choice. I remember, I remember in Iceland driving hours till we found the right, the in right Iceland, spot. Yeah. Um, because yeah. And, and in red, I remember going to the same three sand dune spots and he was like, these aren't the right sand dunes. And then the next morning, hmm, maybe it can work. So let's go back to the other sand dunes we were yesterday to just double check. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway. And just in post for red, this is some of the CGI we're making, just like a floating drone that has this, this uh, ornamental aesthetic and some of the work that we're doing now with, with CGI. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> there you go. Stop, don't show any more. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kevin and, and Matthew, for hosting us. We're, we're really happy and, and grateful for your partnership. And um, these monitors are, are wonderful, and they're helping the team out a lot. And yeah, we're happy to be here. And, and you guys, too. And we really appreciate having such awesome subject matter to talk about. And this stuff is so much fun. And hopefully our, our, our viewers will uh, feel the same. Yeah. And we'll all that, right? So we, we appreciate you. and and. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yeah. All right. All right. Good. Well, thank you guys. <laughs>